Hey, what is up? Thomas Dimitrov with Scott Goldman, the world-renowned sports psychologist, the head of AIQ. One of the best profiles, by the way, Scott. I'm doing my, my, my pitching for you. I think in sport in the world, even though you just had comments about me, you know, shaving my legs as a cyclist, but that's a whole other story. Have a great deal of respect for you. You're out in, you're out in California right now. That's right. Working one of my other jobs. So we're bringing the juice today. And uh, yeah, here's a fun fact for all the listeners. Thomas Dimitrov shaves his legs. No judgment here. <laughs> well, we can get into that, but you've told me not to because, you know, somehow when we're mountain biking and, and cycling, we, we don't care about that. Seriously, though, let me ask you a, a couple quick questions before we get into our, our main event topic here today. You're out, you're out in California. Again, just so everyone knows, the people that are joining lately, you have been involved with the NFL for a number of years with a number of teams. You're up to eight teams right now that you work with, correct? Yeah, so I know this kind of is confusing a little bit, but when it comes to the AIQ, we're across all five major leagues, and we're working with multiple teams in all of them. And then for me, as, as a day job, I'm a sports psychologist by training and trade, and I've been doing that for 20 years, and I'm currently working for an NBA team. And your NBA team is a really highly regarded team. So it's really cool to know that you're in the middle of a, a really, really successful franchise. And I had an opportunity to be that way in the past when I was working at a, at a mid-man level with the Patriots. And it's always interesting to really take in all that you learn. And you're obviously a very educated person and appreciate learning all the time, which is a good segue into, you know, learning a little bit more about what's been on my mind a little bit. This last Sunday, I wake up. And I really don't have much on my on my agenda besides hanging out with my kids or going for a bike ride or getting on my motorcycle, whatever it may be. And I started thinking, it is really peaceful. And yet I stepped back and I thought it was never peaceful on game day. Let's talk about game day. Let's talk truly game day. I'm talking about from the morning of the game till the very end of that night. Let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And we can dice this up any way you want. Let me quickly lead in on the good, bad, and the ugly, and I'll summarize this, and we can go into detail, of course, more in our dialogue. The good side of being a general manager on game day is you finally see the, the fruits of your trade, right, of all of your efforts coming to fruition when things are rolling and things are coming together. You get a chance to see the players. You get a chance to see how the players are interacting, of course, live. You get a chance to see how they succeed or how they recover and their resiliency that is a really special part. You worked so many years as a GM to finally get there. And then on game day, the pomp and circumstance of it all is real. And it really sinks in that you are a part of something that only 31 other people in the league, uh, excuse me, in the world have at that point, at least with this league. So it is a special side. That's the good side of game day. And there are many other elements that we could get into. The bad side of game day, as you can imagine, is honestly, as a general manager, there's very little that you can do to influence the game. It's when people ask me what was the toughest thing of the job, part of the job over my years, Scott, it literally was game day. When you have no influence, you can't call down to the sideline, you can't adjust a play, you do nothing. You might as well just sit in the locker room because there's really not a ton while the game is on that you can do. That is complicated for a competitive person and obviously every general manager is. There's also the bad side very quickly, Bad things happen on game days when you lose, when people lose their, their mind or lose their, you know, proverbial shit in the locker room after the game. I remember when Mike Smith and I were, we were really beating our heads against the wall, losing to the Saints. And we had an issue with the player and, and Ray Edwards was a player. We'll call it out because Ray and everyone knew about it. It went down and I saw Mike Smith. who was a pretty even keel guy, but very, very competitive. And man, that was a tough discussion about, you know, probably wanting to rip heads off. Those are tough times because there's a lot going on and it's bad energy, but it happens and it happens often. And you know that we'll get into this. The ugly side, of course, the ugly side is the very end, end results. It's coming down after, you know, towards the end of the game with all the diatribe and all of the sort of, sort of invective flowing your way as a general manager, people cussing you out, can't throw things anymore. Back in the seventies, you could. Luckily, I would have probably had a number of knots on my head during these last few years, but those are the real ugly times culminating with when your owner calls you at the end of the, the day on a Sunday, when like he fired Dan and, and myself at the end of October or in the middle of October last year, 
that's a really ugly day when you have to go over and have someone tell you mid-season you're fired. So those are good, bads, and uglies. I'd, I'd be interested to get your take on what you see the game day as. Well, you know, I, I had a pretty unique space for my game day, which was I was in the box. And um, as you know, like... Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. You were in the box as a psychologist? Yeah, yeah. I mean... I mean, that's uh, massive. Yeah, yeah. I, that's unbelievable. Yeah. I, um, I just, I think it's really a testament to um, the value and the impact and the involvement that, that the coaches and the front office wanted me with the organizations I was working for. So... Um, for those that might not know, you know, being in the box is where you're with the players and the coaches on the sidelines. And um, it's amazing because originally I thought my job would just be to observe and absorb and then have that be something that I could bring back later on in the week in dialogue. But I had coaches and I had players coming up to me. I'd, sometimes I would say that sat, uh, Sundays was some of my busiest days. You know, um, I, I can tell you a story about a p particular player who got his first start rookie and he was so amped up. He just, he had really what, what many clinicians would diagnose as a panic attack. So we were kind of triaging that right there on the sidelines. Or I remember, and you know, football is such an emotional game, especially in the heat of the moment where another player, a running back, fumbled the ball on the one yard line, thought he cost his team the game. And, you know, the head coach, uh, sorry, the running back coach came over to me and was like, hey, can you go talk to that guy? And I just remember, because this was during my first year, I was like, really? Now, like, there's still time on the clock left. Like, we still got, uh, you know, air in our lungs. Let's keep swinging. But so it was amazing how much dialogue I had with both players and coaches during game days. There were times where I, I just felt emotionally exhausted. I, I kind of joined that experience you were talking about. Well, what a what a great dialogue on that to be able to share that because again, most people, even in of course in our league, we know the importance of mental health and it's so much more at the front of of most everything these days. But I was thinking about that, man. If I knew that you had that part of your job and you were accessible, we would have hired you that much more full time with the Falcons, even though we relied on you a great deal, AIQ related. If I knew that I'd be popping down in between my popcorn and whatever else I ate during the, during halftime to, to, to seek your advice. Because again, the emotions as a general manager during the game, having your hands tied, your cell phone tied, believe me, before Ray Farmer got fined and whatever else happened with some of those other GMs that we used to call down my first year, Scott, I would call down, and I, this was before we even knew it was a rule. I would like call down and no one would answer. And I'd be like, why are they not answering? But I had all desire to like, give me the, give me the coordinator. Let me, this is ridiculous. Why are we not playing A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z? Of course, we couldn't do that. Your emotions go from there to there, to high and low, to angry, to happy, to also trying to be pretty nice when you're sitting beside your owner, because you have to navigate that. Yeah, I mean, I know that I've had many conversations with front office personnel and GMs, and sometimes I kind of tie it into like parenting. It's it's sort of allowing your son or daughter to to borrow the car, and you're still like you know ask any new parents or you know new to teenage parents how well they sleep the first time they allow their kids to go out and 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 go out on a Saturday night, right? So or, or you know with younger parents, it's the idea of letting go of the bicycle you know, and taking the training wheels off and hoping that your son or daughter continues to ride. So there is this really interesting sort of like Zen approach where you got to let go and yet you still want to hold on. And it's always with good intentions and protection, you know? Um, so it, it is, it's, it's an amazing experience. I, I give a lot of credit to the ones that can suppress the desire to do something sometimes not doing something takes more energy and effort than doing something. No, that's, that's a great point. And I think as we grow and we mature in the job, you, you hope as a general manager, you, you calm down and you know what to expect around the corner. And there's no question that happens, but believe me, as the competitive side goes, when you think about your livelihood, you think about pulling things out for a city that you have a great deal of respect for. It's not easy to, to lose to the saints two or three times in a row and not come out and see that that square um, paper towel holder in the coach's room, just Dan and, Dan and I's room, Dan and my room, and uh, and do a couple body shots to it. 
I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to say that happened. It didn't only happen really one time. And I was like, so pissed coming off. And I was like, control your emotions, brother. Like, that's not me. I normally, I mean, I'm, ex I'm excitable. Dan opens the door. He sees me about fifth or sixth punches into this, into this, you know, whatever it was on this, on the wall. Luckily I wasn't punching a cement wall. And uh, he looked at me and I looked at him. He just closed the door quietly and let me be. It was, <laughs> That's it was such kind a of great a, Coach was, Quinn response too. I mean, here's what's amazing, right? Is like, as a leader, you got to make that decision while yet still maintaining your own emotionality, which is if I express this emotionality, does that fire up the troops and get everybody to like, you know, follow me up the hill? Or if I express that, does it in some way show like a, a weakness? Like I have an inability to control myself. So I, I can tell you, it's been interesting because uh, I've, I've had to hold a few people back, literally, like, right? Like sometimes when two people are in conflict and they're about to throw punches and, you know, I'm five, six, I'm not a big dude, especially not in the football space. So I know one thing, like when I've hold, held some people back, they really didn't want to get into the fight because the truth of the matter is there's no holding, like I'm not holding back some of these big guys. So I, I always thought to myself, it's, it's great how puffed up we can get when the reality is we're just puffing up. Just remember at five, six to, to five, eight and a half, like me, always you look at them and you shoot for the leg, get them off balance. So big, big guys, like, you know, our, our head of all creativity, Jason, you got to get them off balance, man. And then, then you're fine. Jeff I'm, Van I'm Gundy joking. style, right? You just got to go Jeff Van Gundy yeah. style. That's right. Hey, be, you know, before we move on from this topic, so very quickly, I think this is important. From organization to organization, it's determined what the role for a general manager would be on game day. My situation in Atlanta from day one all the way through the 13 years, I, it was a self-imposed role for me. Of course, I get there. I do my handshaking. I spend some time with the other GM, talk to the head coach a little bit, talk to personnel watch their team warm up a little bit, but otherwise my focus, mine as, as a GM, I always thought my best role was to be analyzing a little bit more bigger picture, watch our players, not only on the field, how they interacted, what their emotions were like, what their resiliency was like, how, how things played out again on the sideline, as well as on the field and before the game and after I was a, I was like a sponge taking it all in, whether they knew it or not. I did not spend my game days like some personnel GMs do evaluating and, and, and scouting for future, you know, whether they're free agents or future opponent stuff. I felt that we had plenty of time to do that on the film or in film, you know, in the film rooms and on, you know, in the video work that we did. My day was used mostly to really hone in, probably taking a little bit of the Scott Goldman approach. I was looking at it from a much more psychological standpoint and I, and I appreciated that. That's, that's cool. It's good to hear that. I mean, I think what's really interesting and again, like being a dude that was in the box, right? Like there's a lot of data to mine and there's, you know, this is chess, not checkers and there's complexities and ripple effects. So it's sort of like, you know, if you're watching uh, uh, an offensive lineman who's having a bad day, and then you're watching the interaction between the offensive lineman and your offensive line coach. And then, and then it's also like, well, wait a minute, is this really about the offensive lineman or is it about the defensive line player he's opposing? This stuff is so complicated. And, and you know, the, the best GMs I've been around, yourself included, they are just constantly absorbing data. And I think what's really interesting, having had some intimate conversations is, I think sometimes their initial takeaway is they're not even quite sure what to make of it. It's almost like somebody has dumped a bunch of puzzle pieces on a table and, and some of the pieces aren't even flipped the right way, not just rotated, but actually flipped the right way. And so what I, I try to do when talking with the GMs and, and, and the front office personnel is one, I try not to bother them because you can see that three-dimensional puzzle piece stuff that they're putting together. They're really thinking and absorbing and digesting. But every once in a while, one of them will come up to me and they'll say something like, hey, you see that guy over there? Like, what's that all about? And that's where some really interesting conversations, because I think you would agree with this, Thomas. There is nothing like being in the stadium on game day. There is just, it's not quite captured on TV. It's not quite captured on film. Like sometimes you just got to kind of like, feel it. And, and there's, and that's 
something that um, you got to kind of like record it and then bring that up later in that evaluation without having any kind of recency bias because of the outcome of the game. You know, it's, that's a hard, it's that's a hard craft. It's, it is. I think over the years, the people that I really respected in this job and watching them from afar and sometimes closer, they were the ones that had the bandwidth to really welcome your line, the, the, the data absorption to a level that a lot of people were thinking, wow, that, that's beyond uh, uh, fathomable. And I think that with everything else going on, as well as you, you know, watching for me, excuse me, watching everything on the field and how the players are and how the coaches are too, which is a whole other thing. And also, by the way, to the left of me, how Arthur Blank was responding to every little nuance to the game. And then to the right of me, the president, Rich McKay, doing the same thing and, and Rich calling the league office because of being the head of the competition committee. Man, I, you want to talk about being bombarded. By the time I got back at the end of the day, I mean, that was my most enervated day of, of the week and, and even more so probably than, than draft day though I still wasn't involved in a way that was going to affect. Great, great topic, Scott. Great insight. I appreciate you. Whether I disagreed with the head coach and he was wrong doesn't matter because in the end, that was my job and that was my responsibility to make sure that we got it right. Come hell or high water, it had to be as close to being right as possible. All right, Scott, we're on the on the couch session. Go for it. Yeah, you know, so there's so many things to talk about being inside the mind of a general manager. So I appreciate your willingness to to let us kind of crack open the cranium. You know, one of the thoughts that I had going back to our first segment a little bit is from the moment you fall in love with a player to the moment where that player doesn't quite pan out. There's about a million different steps there, right? So I just want to start with this thought. No general manager or head coach has ever gone after the draft and said, oh, we just didn't get our player. You know, oh, we got, you know, the, the, the story and the narrative is like, oh, we got everybody we wanted. We got the number one, every, we got the top of our board. That's what everybody says. But you and I both know the truth. Like you and I have both been in those war rooms where they're, where, where the board plays out in weird ways. So it's easy when you and the coach are side by side on a player what about when you and the coach are not side by side on a player? Let's start there, but I want to walk through that mechanism a little bit. How do you navigate when you and the coach are not side by side on a player? So I think the first thing to that point, that's a really good initial question. As a general manager, ultimately you're in charge of acquisitions, college and pro. So they fall on you. Even if you don't have final 53, Scott, you, that's your role. So it is imperative leading into, you know, the, the side by side or not side by side with a head coach. It gets, uh, use my line, it gets dusty at times. Sometimes it's really smooth and everything you're, you're in line, you're high fiving when you acquire them during the draft or in free agency. And when they're doing well, when there was, when, when you're at loggerheads on a player and, and rarely was I with, with Dan, that just wasn't our, our approach. We did disagree with people. But when that happens, if, for instance, he wanted a player and I didn't and we brought that player in, you, you know, you want to talk about waves of emotion. There, there can be hints of anger, irritability, resentment. Um, you know, I wish I could take this back. Uh, what was I thinking? It does ultimately come back to the, the GM saying whether I disagreed with the head coach and he was wrong doesn't matter because in the end, that was my job. And that was my responsibility to make sure that we got it right. Come hell or high water, it had to be as close to being right as possible. So I could look at the head coach and say, well, he was wrong and feel a little agitated about that or the coordinator, which we could get into, or the position coaches or the scouts. It ultimately comes down on the general manager. So let's go one step more personal, if you don't mind. One thing I've come to appreciate is – GMs can make their life's work, their life's identity, right? Like if you go to a cocktail party, what do you do? And you'll say, I am a kind of thing. So 
scouting talent is not just what you do, but for some people, it's also perceived as who I am. And so when you take that shrapnel, whether it's from ownership, fans, or coaches, right, you're taking this hit like you're an idiot, you're the moron because of what you chose or because of what you saw. It's, it's just, it's a more personal connection to the selection and the commitment to that player. So how do you navigate the emotionality when that player is not who you thought he was? Well, it's, it is, it's tough to navigate because yes, you hit the nail on the head. The majority of general managers by trade are personnel evaluators and the majority get the job because they are adept personnel evaluators, Scott. They're not just run of the mill personnel people. They got the job. Now they have to grow and learn. They have to make the right decisions. When you look at some of the recent guys who have been fired, excluding me for a minute, you see there are some really good evaluators, but they didn't make the right decisions. In the, in the end, they lost their job because more of decision making. Well, when wait, you start I'll talking- jump in on that, though, Thomas, because you could make the argument they made the right decision at the time with the information they had. It's the outcome that turned out to not be right, which kind of leads to the next question, which is, you know, I've often noticed the conflict, right, where the where the GM wholeheartedly believes in the player and yet the coaches are just not seeing it on the field. And so the GM and the coach now get into a, a really unique coordinated dance between like, hey, are you coaching them right? But the same way you don't want to be judged as tied to your selection and identification talents they don't want to be judged based off their coaching talents. So how do you go about navigating that relationship element to it too? Well, so, so yes, first though, just to finish my last, my last quick point, it is personal for us. Those of us who by trade are evaluators, when a player doesn't work out, it's like the coordinator screwing up on a play call or a head coach, not time managing. Those are really deep seated, egregious errors. When a, when a player does not work out or they're being criticized for their ability to evaluate, that at the, in the very end is what is at the core to your point about being defined. We're, we're much more defined by that than cap management or athletic performance or psychological testing. We are, as general managers, for the most part, gauged with how we evaluate in our run, in our run on evaluation. So back to what you're saying, You start thinking about the player. It starts out, this is a good player. And then you start feeling, as I mentioned, the waves of emotion, the anger, irritability, resentment. When you're looking at a coordinator or a position coach who's not developing the player the way that you deem or as an organization we deem is the right way to do it, that's a tough thing because it doesn't come down to anyone else that it is the the coach not developing. Those of us inside know it the fan base, the media, and sometimes owners don't even know it. It this, this player is failing because he's not being coached and developed right. He had a certain amount of potential, but it wasn't reached. Those are really, really acrimonious conversations at times in any organization. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like one of the things that I'll talk about is, you know, when the guns stop being pointed out and start getting pointed in, where people starting to attack each other, that's when I see the slow decline with inevitable termination coming soon kind of thing. You know, the other, and one of the great examples of that, I call it what about So what will happen is someone will say, Hey, you called the wrong play. And instead of the, the person, the coach saying, yeah, you're right. I messed up. He goes, well, I called the wrong play. Well, what about the fact that you drafted this guy when we didn't really even want him or need him kind of thing. And it's like, well, wait a minute, we didn't even address the first issue or the topic at hand. And it's all about this kind of like, let me, it's, it's almost like a sleight of hand kind of parlor game of let's just kind of keep moving the spotlight to somebody else other than me. And, and again, well, parlance, we call it prestidigitation. <laughs> there yes. you go. Well, and then, look, and then, and then you're you no longer got focused it. on getting what's right. You're just focused on That's job right. preservation. You know, it gets well, pretty well, ugly. You, you know, because you've been around a lot of really successful people. You've been around some good coaches who are really good coaches. Maybe didn't work out that well. You've been around personalities that you, you've seen the good and the bad and the survival guys and the thriving guys. This comes back to a relationship between an HC and a GM who can sit down and be really, really honest, respectful and honest, 
Let's go over our mistakes, whether it's in season, in week, or at the end of the season, and truly determine what needs to be adjusted. Why did we screw up on this player? And, and I love that relationship I have with Dan Quinn. We literally would sit down and we would start with us, why, you know, where we were with the player. And then we would go down the list about the people that did evaluate him, not pointing darts as much as why did it go wrong and how can we correct that? Because in the end, you can throw darts and be pissed off all you want as a general manager that your coaching staff doesn't know how to evaluate. They may know how to coach but they don't know how to evaluate. The coaches on the other hand could say, the GM and his personnel department don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. What are they doing? What are they, you know, they're making me look bad as a coordinator. Look, I've had that before. I won't mention coordinators names, but believe me, when I've heard them on the media front after they've gotten fired, they were throwing some serious darts our way. We didn't have the players. That happens. It is a really contentious topic. And yet the, the, the irony of it is, when everyone's operating well and you're winning games, the, the, the shortcomings and, and sort of idiosyncrasies uh, performance-wise and personality-wise are, are, are kind of uh, veiled. It's when you start losing and things start going awry, people get really defensive, and that's human nature, which you know. No, no, I, I think we could probably go on for hours about this, but let's move it and hit to the quick hitters. Start getting that sort of uh, sort of boiling over and and and, and uh, mixture of opinions and and thoughts within an organization. It it permeates. I mean, it's it's everywhere. It's at the water coolers. Unfortunately, it's on the field. It's in the coaching staff. They start talking about it. It's in the management side. It's the owner. Okay, Scott. Let's get into the quick hit section. All right, let's you, go. Are you ready? I got three for you. First one. Let's start with the good or the great. Baltimore Ravens, how are they doing it? Great question. My personal opinion is they have been decimated by injuries. I think they're 13 on their on their IR, Scott, right? That's that's legit, believe me. As team builders, you're scrambling around like crazy, always trying to find the, the fill people. They're doing a great job, and it really comes down to the organization. It starts with the owner. Their owner is one of the most respected owners in this league. He takes care of his people. He gives them the right keys to the, to, the, to the vehicle, so to speak, to the kingdom. Both the GM, Eric DaCosta, John Harbaugh, they roll together well. They, they, are, they are two guys that have a really good understanding and respect for each other. And that's really, really important to, to make sure that you glide through these injury times. And you also have a quarterback that's not playing that well. Can you imagine if you looked at all of this and thought a team was going to be successful? This comes down to how fa the foundation of leadership within that organization. No doubt. I mean, this is one of those classic situations where on paper you could go, this thing can go south quick or this can get ugly fast. And yet uh, what a bunch of resilient winners to, to quote the Chicago Cubs. Like the, the, the Ravens are doing something special here. It's really interesting to watch. Uh, moving to something that's a little bit more complicated. How about down in Carolina? A lot of action and a lot of movement during this bye week. What are your thoughts going on there? Well, bye week time, anytime an organization is making a move, you know, and firing a coordinator, Joe Brady at five and seven, you know, there's a lot going on in that building. Of course, we already know that, you know, there was all kinds of rumblings last year and there were even rumblings now that he was going to be let go at the end of the season anyway, no matter what happened, when you start getting that sort of, uh, sort of boiling over and, 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 and um, mixture of opinions and, and thoughts within an organization, it, it permeates. I mean, it's, it's everywhere. It's at the water coolers, unfortunately. It's on the field. It's in the coaching staff they start talking about it. It's in the management side. It's the owner. And this owner, he's a very smart and very, you know, very good businessman. And he wants his, his hands in, in his, in his uh, finger on the pulse, so to speak. And there's no doubt in my mind that he – he has a very strong opinion about what needs to be done there. And he's got Matt Rule and, and Scott Fitter, who I have a great deal of respect for, navigating something that is complicated. And here they are with a new coordinator trying to, to reach the playoffs. I, I can't imagine it's soft, soft uh, stepping around that organization right now. Yeah, you know, I'll add this. As complicated as it is, I believe in those people that are down there. Like, 
you know, like you pointed out, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been around some phenomenal human beings and there's some really special people here. If, if you're a fan of the Carolina Panthers, hold on. It's going to get better soon. There's some great people down there you can trust. Uh, all right, let's end on a great note. Final one, Miami Dolphins. Wow. Are they getting hot at the right time or what? What do you think? Is this real deal? That's impressive. I mean, Tua's doing his thing. They got him. This, to me, smacks of Patriot-esque stuff. You get Brian Flores down there who knows how to utilize talent. You take the talent you have and you realize, right, Socratic thought. Know what you know and what you don't know. Use what you have and what you don't have, don't use, of course. Don't try to force Tua into being what he isn't. Really stress where he can thrive. And I think they've done a nice job maintaining Obviously, what they're doing with Mac Jones in, in New England right now, you know, with their new quarterback, they're, they're being smart about it. I think they're doing that. They have a really tough defense. Brian Flores does a great job with that, of course. And this team is hitting stride because they have confidence in their defense. They have confidence in knowing how to use what they have. And I think they're going to make a nice push down the stretch. It's, I don't know what's going to happen playoff related, of course. But think about it, where they are right now. When that many, you know, months or a month ago or whatever it was that they were calling for people's, you know, heads down there, GMs and head coaches, this is more settle down, Dolphin people. You have good fo football people involved there. All right. Well, given that you brought up Mac Jones and the New England Patriots, we're going to have a bonus round. What's your take on how in the world do you win a football game only throwing the ball three times? It's unfathomable to me. And yet there's only one guy that can pull it off. So that's what I'll leave it at. Genius is genius.